different ways of doing things. And it'll be interesting to hear if you fall in one of those camps or the other. And I think this will have, in many ways, an important, uh, informative way to just talk about hot times today. So here is the book of Luke. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Here ends our reading. So here we have Mary, and here we have Martha. Interesting story, right? And it does say in here, so sort of very biased in some in one way towards, uh, at least positively towards Mary, I think, because at the very beginning it says, Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So I think you can pretty much tell what Luke was trying to get across uh, in the very beginning of the scripture. But not all of us will agree with that. So, you know, let's think about that. You know, but honestly, Jesus, we have to remember, came to us, into our, to our realm, to our physical realm, to relate to you and to me, to relate, meaning he had to know what you and I were going through. That's what relating is. It's understanding, or at least being empathetic <laughs> to the other person in attempting to find out what it's like. And he came to serve you and me, yes. But the him, remember, he says, it, he, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Right? That's what the him tells us. He's not impressed with our busyness. Uh, he's not impressed with our money managing skills. He doesn't take pride in our willingness to be a part of yet another committee. Nor does he marvel at our clean home. As we see in the story, uh, he has come into the presence of Martha and Mary to converse, to share, and to relate. And Jesus tells us that Martha is, uh, he says, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. So here we see the story of a household in today's story. In that household, we know there are at least two women. Okay? We know there are at least Mary and Martha, right? However, from a story, you know, and stories in the other part of the Bible, we know that Mary and Martha are not just Mary and Martha. There is also in that household Lazarus. Lazarus is in this household also. Um, it's their brother. Now, understanding ancient Hebrew culture, we also know, and we have to surmise, that there would have been a man living in the household. Jesus would never have set foot in this household unless there would have been a man there. He had to. It was just something that was beyond reproach, you know, he, to be remaining uh, among, beyond reproach. He, he could not walk in there without a man being in, this, in the house or being a part of that. And we see that happening even today in many cultures. Now, housekeeping, it's a job that will never end, right? <coughs> right? Oh, yeah. All right, good. Some of us live alone, right? right yeah. A little bit easier when we live alone, right? Yeah. No? <laughs> good one. No one to blame. No one to blame. Sure, and we know that if one is more clean than the other, the other one person's 
picking up after the other all the time, and friction can occur. One person is tiny, the other person doesn't mind a little chaos here and there, and we have a problem. But you bring yet another person in, and depending on the many other tasks demanded of the housekeeper, either accommodation or frustration ends up being the tone of the household. So I can imagine that the man in the household did not pick up after himself. And for all we know, Mary was not tidy also, and Martha found herself forever picking up after her friend. Cooking, paying the bills, watering the plants, even Martha felt compelled to do it. Now, she was, she was a task completer, right? A noble and greatly needed factor in any household or any business, mind you. Let us not lose sight of her important role. In fact, Martha may have been so good at completing her tasks, she took pride in it, right? It's pretty obvious that this she did, to the point where there she was either obsessive about it or she became, it became the one thing that brought her a sense of control, a sense of order. You know that phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness? Some people think it's in the Bible, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> My mother made that one up. <laughs> My mom made that one okay. up. Yeah. Well, Martha maybe had a pride in doing. It was about that idea of order, orderliness that she brought first to life. It's expensive all things. So, here we have doing, being. Who's a doer? One household over here is all doers. <laughs> Two doers. A one sort of like, oh, I'll do some and I'll be some. <laughs> Who's beers? Who's a beer? I'm like, I'll be there. Ah, chaotic people trying to tell each other what to do. 
to do? Interesting. <coughs> Would not have a big church building. Interesting. All right. Let's go to the other side. What if the church was just doers? Or yeah, doers. How do we come from beer and doers? It's an alcohol thing, you know. Beer and doers. Do doers. What, what if the church was a bunch of doers? What would a church look like? A lot of doers. A lot of community. A lot of outreach. A corporation. What? A lot of outreach, helping people. Outreach and helping. Maybe too perfect. Maybe too perfect. Yes. <laughs> of what you're doing for. Losing sight of what you're doing for. If you're just doing all the time. Pretty competitive. Competitive. Interesting. <coughs> so we see we found things that were positive and negative about being beers. We found things that were positive and negative about being doers. And so there's this constant change, I think. And there might even be a pendulum from time to time in organizations, and churches, and whatever. Or it may stick one place because it seems to work. Or it seems to be that is what a community best responds to. Being or doing. <coughs> And more than likely, uh, I don't know. I'm going to guess that this story was written because the community was being too many, do, doing, doing too much. Because it seems so harsh, doesn't it? Do you think Jesus would come to you today and say, uh, all right, hawks, <coughs> you're doing too much. And we all go, no, 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 they are. That might have been it. Or Jesus may have has said it, but you know, Jesus, I don't think, really was somebody we could ever just sort of sort of put in one place and say, oh, that is the Jesus who's always going to be the Jesus, always going to stay that way. This is what he had to say, and it was only that thing, you know? What did we say about, I said earlier, about why Jesus came to be with us? He came to relate to us. Because if Jesus was just relating to a doer, what about the beers? If he was just relating to the beers, he would be relating to the doers. And so, again, as we as communities can find ourselves, um, uh, we have to be careful of becoming one or the other. And as individuals, becoming one or the other. And allowing ourselves, opening up our hearts and our lives doing, being, at the same time. And some of us are better doers, and some of us are better beers. And so, we need to encourage one another to maybe cross over the line a little bit. And we need to encourage ourselves also. Shall I be a doer or a beer? Can I be with Jesus more? Can I be with the person hurting next to me more? Can I be a friend to the friendless. Can I do that mission trip that I never decided to do? Can I do that giving that 
that I never gave? These are all questions, of course, that are up to us as individuals. Now, I'm going to leave it up to you now for a few minutes. What about us in these days when we see the stories that are coming across the news? We see in our towns and we see in our nation and we see in our world. We see strife, anger, violence, pain. What shall we be? Fears or doers in the midst of all of this? What say you? Prayers. He said he felt helpless. Yeah. Yes. Turn off the TV. Turn off the TV? Just forget it. And if these kids are watching it and they're copycatting everything that's going on, I think it started with home invasion in Cheshire and they're repeating and repeating. And people are listening to it and doing it mm. out of ignorance. And I don't like that. They think it's okay. Society doesn't care about these days. Okay. Not a citizen care. They shut it out. Yeah. Yes, sir. I uh, think it demonstrates that uh, God is hope, but not necessarily reality. God is a hope, but not necessarily reality. This shows what's happening, you mean? What? Another way to look at it too is the the world or the fast communication is looking at it from our point of view. What are we seeing? What are we being exposed to? And from their point of view, what are they seeing and what are they exposed to? Bombing, cruise missiles, hidden bullets. Suggesting that perhaps we are seeing on one side of everything from where we are, no matter what the situation. There's no trust Perhaps anymore. we should be seeing the other, whatever the other side might be. People don't trust anymore. People don't trust anymore. I think doing our best to stop whatever small violence is going on in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, the conflict or the bullying or the whatever it is. And just say, hey, wait a minute. responsible for intervening when small, small violences occur right within our, whether it be bullying or some other form of personal violence, physical violence, reputational violence, verbal violence. We need to be willing to step in there because some of us obviously realize that Doug was saying we feel helpless to these, these things that are far away, these things that are global and proportional. Like standing up for violence is not okay. Standing up for violence is not okay. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing, and it's a very, very difficult 
difficult thing for us as individuals to deal with, and it's a very difficult thing to, uh, for us as communities, whether we be near or far away. On Wednesday, um, I don't know what's going to come of it. On Wednesday uh, in, at noon here at the church, I, I and Lee Ireland, who's the intern at the Chester Church, had invited the ministers of the Valley Shore community and the pre and the, uh, 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 the rabbis of the area to come and have a brown bag discussion. I, I've said we're not going to have answers for anybody. If they have, they, we don't have any Muslims in our general area right here. But the word has gone out to. It's open to any clergy of any sort. What are we to do uh, in these times? What are you doing already? So uh, we've, we're going to have that discussion and do some warning, do some praying. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm not quite sure what's going to come of it. But we're going to gather. And hopefully it won't be the last of such a gathering. Maybe that's what all of us might want to do, but more, is what can we do? What can we do in response to violence? I do really like what Emily had to say, is, is interceding where when, when we see quote-unquote small violences occur. Right here. Right here. Big ear shot, right? How can we do that so long? Because, you know, when, when it comes down to it, this person who uh, drove the truck into the crowd in Nice, it was just a person. You know? <coughs> was there violence done to this person? I don't know. Was this a reaction? I don't know. So it's always just people like us. Jesus came to relate to us. We need to find ways to relate to one another. And so that's what hopefully the saving grace of all of this, that Jesus came to relate to us. He felt our pain. He felt our frustration. He wondered aloud in so many different ways. And he spoke to us saying, you are not alone. I am with you. God is with you. God is your strength and your shield. God loves you. God is not only for me, or God is not only for God, but God comes down in God's presence and wants each and every one of you. That's why we say that at the beginning of the service. No matter who you are or wherever you are on my street, you are welcome here, for you are a beloved and unique child of God's own creation. God wants you to know this. You are powerful. Powerful and your beloved. And I pray that you grasp a hold of those two things. Don't only be, don't only do, but be the full human, the full human that Jesus was. And understand the power that that kind of love can do for the world. My friends, may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray.